please all take your seats and make sure your cell phones are turned off. Um, I'm Elizabeth Sherman. I'm a professor of American politics at American University in Washington, D.C. And I'd like to welcome you all to our Friday sessions today of our conference, Is America Governable? Um, our panel today uh, will go right to the heart of that question on our panel discussion of compromise and governance. And of course, these are two extremely uh, complex concepts, and we'll be exploring the connection between those two uh, in light of the Constitution and certainly in light of politics today. Uh, so what our format will be is uh, first a series of introductions of our panelists uh, who will give approximately 10 minutes of remarks. And following that, we'll have uh, questions. I'll pose one question to our panel, and then we'll be opening it up to the audience. So I hope we're going to have a, a very rich and interesting conversation this morning from a, a very illustrious panel indeed. So let me get right to the introductions. Um, in alphabetical order, I'd like to introduce uh, Sanford Levinson, am I right, is the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law at the University of Texas Law School and our wonderful organizer of this conference. <laughs> uh, he is also a professor of government here at the University of Texas. He has authored hundreds of articles and his most recent book is Framed, America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance. Um, on my left is uh, Jack Racco. He is the William Robertson Coe Professor of History and American Studies and Professor of Political Science and Law at Stanford University. His principal areas of research are the origins of the American Revolution and the Constitution. He is the author of six books. Um, including Original Meanings, Politics and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution, which won the Pulitzer Prize in History, and Revolutionaries, A New History of the Invention of America. Uh, Jane Mansbridge is the Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Values at Harvard University. She is the author of Beyond Adversary Democracy, that would be great, Jane. <laughs> we could get there. Um, she's the uh, and she is the author of the award-winning book, How We Lost the ERA. Um, she is also the editor of Beyond Self-Interest, Feminism, and Oppositional Consciousness. Professor Mansbridge uh, focuses on democratic deliberation and the public understanding of collective action problems. Finally, uh, Dennis Thompson is Professor of Public Policy and the Alfred North Whitehead Professor of Political Philosophy at Harvard University. Professor Thompson is the founding director of Harvard's Sacro Center for Ethics. His books include Just Elections, Creating a Fair Electoral Process in the United States, Restoring Responsibility, um, Ethics in Government, Business, Health, and Healthcare, and Ethics in Congress, From Individual to Institutional Corruption. He's also the author of uh, a book that is very relevant to our discussion today, The Spirit of Compromise, Why Government Demands It, and Campaigning Undermines It. So please join me in welcoming our illustrious panel. that the issue of compromise has become an American obsession um, is because of Jack Rako's good friend, James Madison, uh, who, uh, with others in Philadelphia, um, either developed or foisted on us a system of separation of powers that by definition creates multiple veto points with regard to the passage of legislation. 
and therefore does indeed require compromise if anything can be done. Um, Madison, one of the most fast that's the most famous writings is the 51st Federalist, where he talked about ambition countering ambition. But what he suggested is that each of the branches would be jealous to preserve the prerogatives of its, its own powers, uh, and that they would be composed of people committed more or less to a striving for the public interest in the public good. Not that they would necessarily agree on what it was, but that that would be their uh, North Star. Uh, one of my favorite articles, building on a lot of political science research, is by Daryl No Relation Levinson um, and Rick Pildes, uh, both of whom are at the NYU Law School, called Separation of Parties, Not of Politics. And what they argue is that Madison got it disastrously wrong in believing that the principal uh, reality of American politics would be separation of powers. Instead, by 1800, and Jack might correct me on this point, because it really might be by 1795 or 1796, you have the development of a party system that takes over American politics for good and for ill, and means, as we learned yesterday, that party competition is significantly more significant at the end of the day than branch competition. If parties exist in order to seize power legally, that is in elections, not coups, but in elections, then there are incentives to do whatever you can to deprive the other party of passing legislation that would be viewed by the general public as a genuine accomplishment. Because what incentive do you have to do to pave the way for the opposition? And so I suggested yesterday in my remark that Mitch McConnell rationally concluding that Ted Kennedy elected George W. Bush in 2004, and that Newt Gingrich, having decided to throw his presidential candidate, Bob Dole, um, over the cliff for his own internal <laughs> ideological purposes, gave Bill Clinton the opportunity to waltz to re-election by signing the so-called welfare reform bill. Uh, so as I said last night, my view of the Congress is behaved entirely rationally, not ideologically. There are certainly people in the Republican Party, as we talked about last night, who have bitter and ideological opposition to everything that they believe Barack Obama stands for. I have no particular reason to believe that Mitch McConnell is one of those people, but I think there's lots of evidence that Mitch McConnell cares about the political health of the Republican Party, and the health is not going to be attained by cooperating and compromising with Democrats. Now, as I'm already suggesting, and as is my kind of <coughs> mantra, and at least one of my motivations for organizing this symposium, is that I believe that one always needs to look at the constitutional structures and ask whether they serve us for good or for ill in the 21st century. Uh, if we had a parliamentary system, which we're not going to, but if we had a parliamentary system, then it would be no big deal that the opposition party isn't really compromise-oriented. That's not their function. Um, if, um, I forget which of the Miliband brothers is now head of the British Labour Party, if you were to go on the BBC and to say that my aim is to deprive David Cameron of a second term as British Prime Minister, that would not generate any headlines or any punditry on, you know, on, on Miliband's being almost unpatriotic. That you'd say, yes, this is exactly what an opposition leader is supposed to do. And the fact is, it doesn't matter that the Labour Party is vehemently opposed to the policies of the Tories and the, the Liberal Democrats.
uh, because they have a majority. Her Majesty has a government, and I've quoted in several things I've written in exchange in 1987 in China, um, where I had the privilege of participating in a seminar on the bicentennial. Um, um, and that week, Congress passed a resolution denouncing Chinese repression in Tibet. And the spokesperson at the State Department said that Tibet is an internal matter of the People's Republic of China. And one of the Chinese scholars asked, said, altogether understandably, I'm confused. What is the position of your government? And I said, not meaning to be kidding, we don't have a government in the way that Her Majesty has a government. Um, that we have people who are endlessly contending for the ability to claim that they speak in behalf of the American people. Uh, and this was just an, an unusually dramatic illustration of that. So we are obsessed, perhaps correctly, by the pathologies of a refusal to compromise because of the constitutional system we've got. Not because all political systems necessarily depend on the same propensity to compromise. Obviously, any political system that is to avoid degenerating into civil war does require some degree of compromise, uh, some agree to, agreement to accept the election, some agreement to say, well, yes, you do get the ability to nationalize the industries or to denationalize the industries to uh, support the United States in Afghanistan or to withdraw the troops from Afghanistan. So there is some level of systemic compromise that's required even in parliamentary systems, but not day-to-day -day compromise uh, in the way that we talk about this country. Uh, the filibuster is not known, I suspect, in most parliamentary systems. This is a large world. There may be a parliamentary system that, where the, there's a you know, filibuster equivalent, but I'm not aware of it. So I begin simply with that constitutional point. I want to take the remainder of my remarks, and I'll count on you, you know, to cut me off in 10 minutes. In talking about a movie that I suspect that many of you have seen, uh, Lincoln, which I regard as an, it's a very good movie, deserves awards. But I regard it as a very odd movie in a number of ways. Because it's very, very difficult to view Abraham Lincoln as a paragon of compromise. Uh, or, let me put it a slightly different way. To the extent that he was a compromiser, he raises fundamental questions about the differences between what Avishai Margali, an Israeli philosopher who wrote a very interesting book on compromise, that's discussed in Dennis and Amy's book. He talks about rotten compromises as against simply unfortunate compromises. The Senate that James Madison correctly believed was an evil, that is, equal voting power in the Senate. Madison also said in the 62nd Federalist was a necessary evil, the necessity being you wouldn't have a constitution without submitting to the extortionate demands of Delaware and the other small states, and I suspect that's correct. And the Senate, though terrible, is not evil in a way that one ought to condemn Madison for deciding that it's a price worth paying. But the other so-called great compromise, of course, is slavery. And one can ask very real questions about whether that price was worth paying in order to get a constitution. One might very well say yes, especially if you're not from the group that paid the costs of that compromise. Um, now, here's where Lincoln's very interesting, because Lincoln defended the fugitive slave law, uh, certainly you know, tied for first among the most unjust laws ever passed uh, by any Congress. Um, he also said in his first inaugural that uh, he did not object 
on a constitutional basis or a legal basis, the slavery word existed. Uh, rather, the formal struggle for the war about the war was extension of slavery in the territories, about which he adamantly refused to compromise. But then one of the questions that I, I direct at particularly at, at Dennis is whether one praises or condemns Lincoln for his refusal to compromise on slavery in the territories. After all, if you can stomach the fugitive slave law, if you can stomach supporting, as Lincoln did, the original 13th Amendment, which would have guaranteed slavery in perpetuity in those states that had it, then why exactly praise him for drawing the line at extending slavery into the territories? If, on the other hand, you praise Lincoln for being a man of principle with regard to slavery, then how do you explain or how do you justify his compromises with slavery? Uh, it takes two to start a civil war. I do not wish to engage in a defense of the Confederates or of the statue of the Confederate war dead in front of the Texas Capitol. Uh, but they were not the only party who chose to go to war. Uh, it also required a decision by Abraham Lincoln to go to war. Um, so that's one aspect that the movie Lincoln does not talk about. Uh, it starts well after his first inaugural. Then, of course, Lincoln conveniently leaves the scene, thanks to John Wilkes Booth. And so we never find out. You know, there's no way of finding out, for sure, what his policy on Reconstruction would be. Uh, to what extent would he have been all that different from Andrew Johnson? Uh, it's like the endless debate about uh, JFK in Vietnam. Um, but Reconstruction uh, was not, so to speak, a Tea Party. Uh, it required highly uncompromising uh, actions. Uh, the only great movie that's ever been made about Reconstruction, alas, is Birth of a Nation. And it would be very interesting to see what somebody like Steven Spielberg might do with Reconstruction as opposed to the generally feel-good um, uh, 13th Amendment. Uh, which did not transform the country uh, in a way that Reconstruction was designed to reconstruct. And it was a failure, of course. It was a failure because of the Compromise of 1877. Uh, and then one can legitimately ask, well, would one have wished a longer occupation and the execution of many members of the previous ruling elites led by Jefferson Davis? Uh, whose statue raises the Texas Capitol, and whose citizenship was restored during the Carter administration. Uh, and Jimmy Carter signed a proclamation uh, saying, in effect, let bygones be bygones. Uh, we're all great Americans. Uh, well, I think these are the questions that really have to be wrestled with in a, in a discussion of compromise. First of all, to what extent is our concern about compromise generated by the Madisonian system that may or may not be working in the 21st century? And secondly, are there limits to compromise? Are there times where you indeed want your political leaders to draw lines in the sand and to say this far or no farther because what you're really asking me to do is to agree to a rotten compromise rather than simply uh, an unfortunate compromise that I will make in the interests of the larger whole. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Um, Professor Mansbridge? I think I'm going to, um, let me see, I have to turn this in. I'm going to uh, go up to the, to the front because I can't see people. So I have to turn this in. slightly intimidating, strange place, because when you're sitting here, you can't see any of the people in the back. And so I hope you don't mind if I come up and, and talk this way instead of, can everybody hear me in the back? Yes. Can you hear me in the back? OK, I'm going to follow on Sandy's comments, with which I very largely agree, um, and take first a dip into Western civilization, and then a plunge into now. Uh, 
So here's my quick first dip into Western civilization. Since 1085, when the first social contract was written, Western <coughs> political theory has focused on resistance to tyranny. And I'm going to argue that we don't have to be so obsessed with tyranny now. Of course we should care a lot about tyranny. And we've got a lot of uh, protections in place. But I'm going to argue that since 1085, there's been a drumbeat of anti-tyranny, absolutely appropriate, throughout the Middle Ages, when they wrote those early social contracts, when there was a flourishing of social contract theory in the 16th century among Protestant writers, when that social contract theory was taken up by those who framed the American Constitution. Absolutely appropriate. And you can see in the evolution of the doctrine of separation of powers, this uh, obsession with tyranny. When Aristotle wrote, he thought that you had ought to have a balanced constitution, bringing in parts from the best, from the few, from the many, into a kind of mixed polity that would be balanced and therefore would govern well. He cared quite a bit about governing well. Now by the time you got past the old social contract theories, all this, by the time you got to Machiavelli, his theory of separation of powers was that the different branches should watch each other. It was a suspicion-based theory. And then when Montesquieu evolved it, separation of powers became the protection of individual liberties. And when the framers came to the separation of powers, they took Montesquieu's protection of individual liberties as absolute truth. By that, at that point, any people writing a, a constitution in the democratic tradition would have picked up Montesquieu's understanding of separation of powers as preventing tyranny. Now, I think that we are, um, and of course Madison was not just concerned with tyranny, as people said the other day, I think Alan Wolf, or various people pointed out. He was a federalist, not an anti-federalist. He wanted effective government. He, the Articles of Confederation hadn't worked. He was trying to produce a central government that worked. And he wanted a balance between concern with tyranny and actually getting things done. So that's why he was so against supermajorities, for example. Um, but the separation of powers was an article of faith. Um, it, that was what pre prevented individual tyranny. Now I could argue, just at the, right here at the Western Civ part, um, that, that, that we're in a different place today from the, the, all these eras when people had kings and they were worried about the tyrannies of kings, we don't really have to worry about kings a lot today, you know, that, that somehow or other kings are going to take over. We do have to worry about executive power, but I'm going to point out, or I will point out now, that what executive power in the United States has grown in part because Congress has stopped being able to govern. And when you look at a lot of the growth in executive power, you see that it responds to failures in congressional power. So we don't have to worry about kings, we have to worry about sometimes the growth of executive power, but the way to, to handle that may not be to damp down executive power, but to help Congress govern better. Um, so I think we ought not to be worried so, so much about kings right at the moment. We also have what Madison didn't have, got quite soon, a Bill of Rights, which is now far more than the original Bill of Rights. The original Bill of Rights was just designed to keep Congress from doing X, Y, and Z. But now the Supreme Court has expanded it to say that all the states can't do X, Y, and Z either. The Bill of Rights has become a protection of individual rights rather than a thing that keeps the federal government from doing bad stuff. And that protection of individual concept has spread worldwide and now in every developed country in the world. You have not only a Bill of Rights, but a counter-majoritarian judicial system that's been going and going and going and quite well established to protect those rights and a populace who expects those rights. That's different from when Madison thought that the uh, individual liberties had to be protected by the separation of powers. 
They had no idea of a Bill of Rights, no idea of that kind of tradition, which now every developed democracy <coughs> is not only familiar with, but considers an absolute major central part of what they are. We have that. Then finally, we are far more interdependent than in Madison's day. There's a wonderful uh, graph that David Moss has of bank failures um, going from 1864 to uh, 2000. And it shows, if, you know, if, if this is 1864, this is 2000, it shows bank failures going blah, 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 blah. And then going up, of course, at the Depression and then right before you know, right at the Depression, soaring. And then you have the Glass-Steagall Act, which um, uh, requires banks to uh, keep deposits. And then the bank failures go to practically nothing until the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, in which case, if not back to the Depression levels, but they go right up again. All right, laissez-faire, we've just learned that laissez-faire doesn't work in a lot of cases. We have to be very careful. You don't want government to do lots of things. We've also learned that the market is a, a tremendous responder to what people want. It's flexible. <coughs> but when there's collective action problems, and the human race only discovered the logic of collective action problems in the early 1950s, several people discovered it at once. Once you understand the logic of the collective action problem, when you have non-excludable goods, or what I'll call open access goods, you know that individual action in their self-interest, opposite to the market, produces bad results, produces, in fact, quite catastrophic results. And that's when you need, you have to ask, is there an open access problem here? Is there, is there a collective action problem here? That's when you need some kind of government intervention. We have got such incredible interdependence in our economy these days that Madison wouldn't have been able to even encompass it. I mean, that, this, Madison would have, like, flipped out. He, he would have completely um, seen this is a different world. Um, so given the need for more government, and I'm happy to go back to that afterwards. I'm sure not everyone agrees with this. Um, and then when, do we need compromise? Of course we need compromise because, as Sandy says, we're not a parliamentary system. And the Systems of government around the world that are not parliamentary systems are all in one way or another based on compromise. So that's where I plunge into the now. And I want to, I've got, I've got basically good news, uh, bad news, and then maybe a little bit of surprising news. And the good news is that legislators are actually in a better position to do compromise than any of you or me. When we go to buy or sell a house, it's a one-time interaction, and a lot of what's going on is what negotiation theorists call a distributive interaction. That is to say, it's zero sum. Let's imagine that um, you know uh, uh, the seller's reservation price for the house is five hundred thousand dollars, and the buyer's reservation price is seven hundred thousand dollars. You've got what negotiation theorists call a zone of po uh, possible agreement between five hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand. Okay, in that, everything I win, you lose. Everything you win, I lose. It's, it's anywhere, well, we both win if we make the agreement, we both lose if we don't make the agreement, but within that zone, it's just what they call distributive. Then there's integrative bargaining, in which you bring in more issues, in which you say, you know what? I can give you a mortgage on that house, I'll do a seller's mortgage, and da, 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 da. you bring in that issue, and you may find that you have much more common interests on that second issue. So you can sweeten the first issue by the second issue. But by and large, when you're buying and selling a house, you don't have a lot of those separate issues. And when you just don't, when you don't have those separate issues, you just got the one issue. You've got just got distribution. There's a great incentive to a, a, some strategies that work in that situation: deception and intransigence. As Howard Rafa, who was a great negotiation theorist, said, strategic mis misrepresentation is key in this distributive part. <coughs> if I say, I wouldn't sell the house for any more, you know, and if you say, well, yes, but I can, I've got this lovely other house over here that I'm dying to buy, blah, blah, blah. Those things can be basically completely untrue. Now, you know, 
perhaps you don't want to get in the situation of telling lies, but you have what, and of course, David, uh, <laughs> Dennis and I have sometimes thought, um, the intention to deceive. We think that the intention to deceive is unethical, as well as actual deceit, but human beings draw. But in many, many sellings and buyings of houses, there's a little bit of intention to deceive. Similarly, in transients, I'm just not gonna buy it. You, you know, the whole issue of walking out of the store, you know, well, and then the, finally the jewelry seller says, oh, no, no, for you, for you. you know. So intransigence is well known and accepted to, uh, way of handling things when you're in this distributive part of the negotiation. Now the problem is that um, as negotiation theorists have said, the creativity that you need to come up with thinking about the mortgage or maybe even to get what, I won't even get, I'll take your time to talk about fully integrative solutions where actually people don't lose at all. Well, maybe I will. Mary Parker Follett, 1925, she says, here I am in, and I mention her name because she's often lost when people say win-win solutions. They don't realize that it was a woman, Mary Parker Follett, back in 1925, who invented the concept. Remember Mary Parker Follett? Okay, that's my little uh, rant there around, around Mary Parker Follett. She said, I was sitting in the library, and someone comes in, and he wants to open the window to cool off the room. And I don't want the draft. So we're in a compromised situation. If you open the window halfway, I'd still have a draft. He wouldn't get it as cool as he wanted. So I suggested opening the window in the other room. Because I didn't care if it got a little cooler. I, that was fine. But I just didn't want the draft. He didn't care about me getting the draft. He just wanted it cooler. So actually opening the window in the next room got us both what we wanted. Now that required a kind of creativity and the, required a particular kind of creativity, which was that she got inside his mind. He didn't want just the window open. That's what he was asking for. That was what his demand was. That was what his position was in the negotiation. What he really wanted was a cool room. And look, there was another way of getting a cool room, namely opening the window. In the, that kind of um, creativity is what negotiation theorists that's, try, to get, try to teach negotiators to do. But the problem is, that to get that kind of creativity, you have to let the other person into your brain. So in, in order to figure out what you really want, in order to be able to suggest something else. In the distributive part of the negotiation, you want to keep the other fellow out of your brain. So they won't know how intransigent you really are. And you, they, won't, they won't know that you're deceiving. Now the good news is that legislators are in an iterated, ongoing set of interactions. They build reputations. So it's actually not all particularly in their interest to get a reputation as being someone who engages in strategic misrepresentation or deceit, outright deceit. Nor is it particularly in their interests if they can see themselves as ongoing legislators as opposed to present. And I think it is. Uh, I think the Republican Party does have more incentives to do this, uh, as Tom Mann suggests, than the Democrats, at least at the moment. If you're in that, if you're not in that position, if you're an old-fashioned negotiator who thinks a legislator who thinks they're going to be there for a while, you actually want to. You don't want to set up a reputation as being intransigent and uh, dishonest. So that's the good news: that legislators are better in a better position than we are when we do one-off negotiations to overcome this. Uh, what's called the negotiator's dilemma, that what's good in the integrative part is not good in the distributive part. Um, and in the legislature, there are these um, uh, repeated negotiations, and legislation has many parts, so it's very easy to add the mortgage, if you will, to add this, to add that, to the other thing, to, add, to create a package. It, it's not very easy, you have to be creative, you have to be thoughtful, you have to think about what the other side really wants rather than what they're saying they want. You have to get together with people and talk it over. You have to engage in uh, interaction. But the good news is that legisla legislation is de beautifully designed for that kind of thing because there are often many parts to it. Um, 
And the other good news is that there are changes in the micro level that Mickey Edwards, I hope everyone re reads his book, and Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein, I hope everyone reads their book, um, suggest um, making much more on the micro level. So there are incentives, we, we can give incentives to, to members of Congress to negotiate. Um, and the, the overall setting on that micro level except for certain rules that are changeable, often by majority rule in Congress, and we, I hope this, this, whole, um, this whole conference will end with, with strong consideration of those rules that can be changed. The legislature is actually a fairly reasonable place to compromise. A fairly, it's designed to make, to, to be a good place to compromise. We could make it that way. But the bad news is on the macro level. Sandy's already pointed out that we've got a constitution that leads to separation of powers, leads to veto points, leads to intransigence. The first past the post voting system in the United States, in contrast to proportional representation, proportional representation it just says these two parties, each of whom does have an incentive to destroy the other, especially if they're close. Francis Lee points out that the closer they are, it's, it's, and I think maybe, uh, I forgot who made the point last night, um, that have, oh, I know, Bill, uh, the, uh, having a, a divided uh, government and having very close parties is the worst. Because if you have um, a party that knows it's going to lose next time anyway, um, it has an incentive to make nice to the party that it thinks will win. And all, all the individual um, legislators who are in the losing party think that they can at least get bridges or this is or that's or the other things but by going along. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. One minute. One minute. All right. Then, so the bad news on the, on the macro level is not only the Constitution, not only the uh, first past the post system, um, the 1964 Civil Rights Act got our parties realigned. Um, primaries, you know, money you're going to hear about. Um, slim majorities, all of these things are very problematic at the macro level. The surprising news, <coughs> maybe possibly surprising news, you know there's lots of calls in popular democracy for term limits and transparency and accountability. Well, I just want to leave you with two thoughts. One is that longer incumbencies lead to greater incentives and capacity to compromise. You build your reputation, you build the skills and the context, the basis in facts, the realism about what can be done. People who have been in Congress or, or in a legislature a longer time have these capacities to compromise. Transparency. <coughs> Closed doors lead to a greater capacity to compromise. When you're together in private, you can begin to disclose a little bit, bit by bit, and the other person discloses a little bit, bit by bit. You can be open, you can let somebody into your mind, you can say things that you might not want to have repeated. That's how negotiations get done. So in 1982, senators singled out most often as a reason for the decline, even then, of 1982, of negotiation and potential self-sacrifice. The reason they saw this decline in the capacity for negotiation <coughs> was the rule opening committee meetings to the public. So I just want to, I'm not saying all long incumbencies are good, God forbid, I've got a list of different things you need to have make a long incumbency good. I'm not saying transparency is, ba is always bad, again, God forbid, in a corrupt system, transparency is your best, um, is your best bet, but I'm saying if we really care about negotiating, if we really care about compromise, let's think of each of the parts of government and ask that question. Does this facilitate compromise? Does it facilitate negotiation? Or does it hurt it? And if we ask that question, we'll come up with slightly different answers to questions like, big questions like the separation of powers, but small, smaller questions like, are we going to insist on sunshine in this particular arena? Are we going to pass something that will keep long incumbencies from happening, no matter how good, how much the constituency actually wants to keep that person in office? Compromise and negotiation has, never been, has rarely been put on the scale. When we ask these questions about long incumbencies and uh, 
transparency. I've never heard anyone say, oh, but that might hurt the capacity to negotiate. That might hurt the capacity to compromise. You don't hear that. Let's put it on the scale. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jack? So I think we're going to experiment with different places to speak from. Uh, I probably started at the podium. Uh, you'll probably stay here as well, so I won't compromise at that point. Um, usually when I have to address an audience like this, I'm here to speak for the 18th century. Um, uh, I often notice, uh, often for uh, the guy I refer to not just as my friend, but my alter ego, uh, James Madison. I, I, I often notice on occasions like this that when people want to say something about Madison, they look at me with a worrisome look, and it could be either that uh, they're wondering how, what I'm going to do to correct them on the one hand, or alternatively whether they're going to hurt my feelings by saying something critical. It's okay to say anything, because we're, we're, we're all here for discussion. Uh, but I do want to kind of, uh, obviously, uh, I assume one reason that Sandy asked me to uh, join this is to try to speak uh, somewhat quasi-crypto authoritatively from, for an 18th century viewpoint. Uh, I happen to be a big fan of the American Constitution. Uh, it's been good to me, and I've, I've been trying to, uh, trying to I, you know, I, I have been trying to reciprocate. I think more fundamentally, uh, I, as a historian who spends, as I like to say, spends most of his waking hours in the 18th century, it seems to me the more you study the process of constitutional formation in this country, the more impressive it becomes. Whatever judgments one makes about, you know, particular decisions, and I'm going to come back and talk about two of them uh, quite specifically, uh, the entire way in which the Americans work out in, over the course of a decade. What does it mean to write a constitution, to define it as supreme law, to get it uh, adopted and ratified uh, in, in, in expeditions, and I think uh, fairly reasonably transparent fashion. Uh, remain, I think, very impressive achievements with, with which, of course, uh, my alter ego uh, is much involved. I want to add to this, I mentioned this to Sandy an email, and, uh, you see my agent this week, I have one. They talk about a book I want to write called The uh, Vices of Our Political System, some Madisonian reflections. Uh, many of you will know that uh, Madison's great uh, preparations for the convention, the high point is a document he drafts called The Vices of the Political System in the United States. I think that's too long a title for a 21st uh, century audience, so I want to economize on it a bit. Uh, and, but I do want to think, uh, as, as I try to do over the course of my career, uh, not for Madison, but like a Madisonian. And I'll try to say something in a couple minutes about, uh, about what that means. Um, and because I think it produces a much more complicated picture of how to think about the nature of constitutional deliberation and political innovation uh, in the first you know, quarter century or so of the American Republic's history. I think basically I, I want to make two sets of points here. And then I'll, you know, I think we're running a little bit behind, so I'll, I'll try to do this fairly economically. I do want to come back to the questions that Sandy raised about the compromises of 1787, where I think my view was actually somewhat different from his. Uh, and then I want to say something about how to think about the separation of powers issue, uh, which actually is a question I think Madison wasn't all that serious about, to be honest, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain why uh, as, as we go along. Um, so uh, I've read about this in my book, Original Meetings, and I've, I've often emphasized this in my teaching to my students at Stanford. Um, there are, of course, two compromises that define the shape of our legislative system going back to 1787. One, of course, is the equal vote in the Senate, and the other uh, was, which obviously is you know, no longer critical, except it's always is so important, so I'll come back to this. The other, of course, is the three-fifths clause in the way in which that affects how we think about the House of Representatives. Um, I agree with Sandy that I think the, the best way to characterize uh, the uh, decision over the Senate is it was a terrible decision, but not evil. I mean, it was a terrible decision. Madison was deeply disappointed with it. He never defended it on his merits. He went into the convention thinking he had a rationale that explained to the small states why they, know, why they neither needed nor deserved an equal vote in the Senate, the privilege they enjoyed under the Articles of Confederation. And on that question, he lost. Um, the key thing to note about this is that the decision uh, over the Senate was not a compromise. It was a defeat. And the critical vote is five states to four with the popular state of Massachusetts, which should have voted, should have made the fifth state to keep the issue deadlocked, voting with this, you know, losing, losing its vote with a split delegation. Uh, it, was, it was a bitter defeat uh, for the large state delegates. The next night, they think about actually abandoning the convention, but decide not to do that. Uh, and the convention proceeds to that point, having lost on that issue, they've learned to call it a compromise <coughs> over the long run. But it wasn't. And the small states, you know, their, their kind of stamina turned out to be greater uh, than, let's say, the reasoning power of the Madison and Hamilton and Rufus King. <laughs> 
doing her more, stuff her more. I'm going to do so on the other side. Uh, so a terrible decision, um, and I think there are lots of ways to explain that. Not an evil one. You know, perhaps it's the price you have to pay. The one that bothers us most, of course, is the rot what uh, Sandy called, using Abishai McGarland's book, the rotten compromise uh, over slavery uh, in terms of the House of Representatives. I actually like that decision. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Obviously, I don't like it because I support slavery. Um, I do think it's important to note that when the uh, framers came up with the three-fifths clause, which Madison actually was the originator back in 1783, uh, it's important to note that uh, it's just a number. It doesn't have the kind of you know, scientific racism of the 19th century behind it. It's just a formula uh, for saying, here's the deal we're going to strike. It's not an attempt to say Africans or African Americans are 0.6 of white people on any kind of scale. It's just a political deal. It was a compromise. And slavery was the real compromise. It was something, in fact, the, 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 the discussions over slavery are much less heated, much less impassioned uh, than the discussions over, over the equal state vote. It was a recognition that uh, you were composing a union uh, based upon two very different uh, social systems, one based on free labor, one based on slave labor. Madison makes quite clear uh, in the debates over the Senate, uh, not over the house makes quite clear that um, you know there is you know the principal division in the United States does not lie between uh, large and small states. It lies between northern and southern states. That he kind of does a Montesquieu who says well to some extent this might be a function of climate, uh, which in a sense is, is is true. But more more basically it is a you know it's, it's a question of the nature of the labor system. So if you want to have a union. That's to say, if you want to have a federal union that's going to go from Savannah uh, to uh, Portland, Maine, of course, we're still part of Massachusetts, or you know, points further north, that's the price you have to pay. That is the compromise you have to make. That's the real issue uh, that you have to confront, and you have to try to come up with some kind of resolution. So to say it's a rotten compromise is always seems to me to be kind of a very problematic notion, unless you want to toss out the whole conception of union and say that the South should have, should have been allowed to go its own way uh, and to remain a slave-owning society uh, until time out of mind, uh, as opposed to having a civil war uh, that would finally you know, alleviate the nation of that burden for reasons that Abraham Lincoln well explained in his second inaugural. I mean, it's too bad in the movie where they had that homey scene at the beginning, which I find is a little problematic of a couple of soldiers reciting the Gettysburg Address already. It's too bad they couldn't recite Lincoln's second. I'm great. Gainesburg address is great. The one year I lived in the South as a boy uh, in Gainesville, Florida, man, you know, many, many, many years ago, many decades ago, right after Brown, uh, we, uh, our, our teacher, like me, came from Chicago, uh, would give a prize to students who memorized the Gettysburg address in Gainesville. <laughs> it was only many years later that I understood, you know, decades later, that, you know, I really understood the significance of what she was doing. Uh, although I knew at the time some of my friends had gone to Ku Klux Klan meetings in East Gainesville. So that was, a, you know, I actually think it's too bad I couldn't have read the second year. In any case, it does seem to me that if we want to think about this issue in a current perspective, um, the whole question of the nature of the political bargain, the, the, the overt compromise with the South, whether it's rotten or not, uh, is, it seems to me, is the necessary price of union as it has to be defined. I think that echoes in our current politics. I, you know, some of you may have seen the, lo the little piece that Gary Wills did where George Packer did at the New York Review of Books and the New Yorker blogs this week about the problem of the South. You know, in one sense, the South is the problem. Let's say, what's, you know, you, we could talk about the principal uh, basis of compromise, uh, principal problem of compromise in, you know, in current politics in terms of the structural rules in the Senate and, you know, the kind of thing that Norm Ornstein and you know, Tom Mann and others have written about. And, you know, I, 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 I never want to, you know, take away from that, but, uh, you know, it's the way in which the South is driving the politics of the Republican Party. Uh, maybe as large a, a, an explanation of our political problems as anything else. So to some extent, maybe we're still playing out that issue, that decision, or the implications of that compromise. So that's my first set of points. My second set of points, I think, comes back to the argument that Sandy makes in his book and that has already come up this morning. I think it has to do with the idea that the Constitution sets up a set of choke points. And that the inefficacy of our decision making is essentially a function of how many of them they are, in addition to the ways in which the rules are complicating the function of the checkpoints uh, even more. And I think that certainly, I'm not going to criticize that as a characterization of how our political system works today, but speaking, uh, you know, from or for the vantage point of 1787, uh, I think I have two kind of comments that uh, I want to make on this. 
the first is I'm not wholly convinced the framers would have thought of uh, thought of what they were doing in those terms. And again, this, I think this is very much a matter of the point. Uh, I think they were thinking more about uh, not structures of choking, but structures of delivery. That's to say, I think they were trying to come up with conceptions of which kinds of decisions were best allocated, best assigned to which institutions of government. And of course, it's true they operated within a Montesquieuian universe uh, where the idea of you know, having balanced government of a constitutional system, an equilibrial system in which different institutions would play a kind of balancing, checking role was certainly part of how they thought about this. But I think when they were thinking creatively uh, about what it was that the new system would do, that they, weren't, that they were trying to struggle their way uh, towards a conception of which institutions would be best designed to carry out which kinds of functions. And I think that's a somewhat different conception from the choke point. Idea. I mean, I know certainly for Madison's case, where Madison, Madison's thinking in this period was dominated by the idea that uh, the House of Representatives, the House that, you know, which, whichever branch spoke most directly for the people would be the most dangerous branch, or in his, in his terms, the impetuous vortex. He was committed to the idea of the Senate as a more deliberate body. Um, he, his ideas about executive power, I think, were quite vague, at least for a few years, did not have a great conception like Hamilton did of what the executive could do. But I think one of the things that was driving the creative nature a federal political thinking in the late 1780s was how to think about the specific roles that institutions ought to play in terms of improving the overall structure of deliberation. I think that's a little bit different from emphasizing just the idea that you have, you have multiple approval points uh, is driving the genius of the political system. And in that sense, I want to come back and say, just uh, make this my last point, say something more about Madison and the separation of powers, something I've been writing about recently for a, a different book I've tried to finish. Um, if you read those famous essays from which you know, Sandy quoted, uh, you know, ending with Federal 51, ambition must be made to contract ambition, the interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place, and then, you know, if men were angels, no government would be necessary, if angels were to govern men, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is, when Madison writes five essays on the separation of powers, but in the end, he says almost nothing about the constitutional separation of powers. When you get to Federal 51, there isn't very much there. There is, there is a statement about you know, the idea that individuals should feel some loyalty to their institutions and they'll check each other. There's one very complicated paragraph on the Senate where I, I love to teach as my students where Madison describes the Senate as less powerful than the House, which I think empirically is counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. So you have to explain on what basis would he, would he have said the Senate would be less powerful than the House. Uh, I think actually, the, if you read the other essays, I think Madison and the separation of powers, the whole thing is open to lots of exploration, lots of, you know, there, there's no one formula. I mean, you thought Montesquieu had it, Montesquieu didn't have it all wrong, but, you know, the Montesquieuian definition or the idea that there, you could rigidly separate and cabin off three different kinds of powers, he thought, he thought that was nuts. He thought basically the whole thing was open, both in Britain and America. There's an endless number of variations you can play on the separation of powers. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think he found the idea very interesting uh, to work with. And so he wrote a couple paragraphs at the end, and people like Sandy, uh, probably, you know, and, and the other Levinson was not related, but who I also know, uh, Daryl, you know, you know, may give more attention to that one formula than it really deserves. What I do think is a better way to think about the Madison, a Madisonian way of thinking about this, is to remember that Madison was deeply empirical. He wasn't wedded to a Montesquieu idea. He was a kind of deeply creative thinker. And I, I think if you follow his history, which I, since I've written his biography and edited by his papers, you know, I've tried to do fairly seriously, uh, you will tend to see you know, how he thought about this in a somewhat different light. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, Madison, in, from about mid 1780s to about 1792, was obsessed or was you know, principally concerned with the idea that the House would be the most dangerous branch. Or, the impetuous vortex. After that, his thinking shifts rather remarkably. From 1793 on, at least for the next seven or eight years, he's really preoccupied with the problem of the presence. Uh, that's to say, that's the, and the it's, I think it's mostly because issues of foreign policy as opposed to domestic policy come to the fore, and he realizes, as Hamilton would have understood ex ante from the beginning, all the advantages that the executive would have uh, when, when that would be the case. And now Madison has to, and along with Jefferson, has to start thinking about how to play catch with this. Of course, that's how he becomes, you know, the principal leader of the nation's first real political party. Uh, originally called the Republican, now the Democratic Party. So there is a kind of, I think, empirical quality to Madison's thinking. 
that I find quite interesting. It means you know you can't lock him into one position without realizing that he had an active career uh, from 1775 to essentially 1817, with 20 years of commentary and retirement. Uh, they will follow that, and there were, he had plenty of time to try to adjust his thinking to uh, you know the functioning of, diff of different institutions. Seems to me that's where we are now. I mean, I don't you know being an 18th century historian, I, I don't have a great scenario for what compromise should look like now, except to say that I think thinking uh, in fairly specific terms, as opposed to terms of broad constitutional change about which, which institutions pose the greatest problems and which ones need to be dealt with most, uh, you know, most, most specifically, uh, is the real challenge. Um, you know, I think, you know, from what little I know about the subject, I'd probably come back to the Senate and would be, you know, deeply disappointed in the kind of what I take to be the minimalist agreement that was reached yesterday you get us, you know, once again past yet another cliff in our in our continuing descent. Um, but to kind of come back to one last point here, which again will be Madisonian. Uh, so let's go back to Federals 51 just for a minute, Sandy. So the curious thing about Federals 51 is Madison does have a couple, somewhat you know, kind of quotable, but not I think uh, you know in the end not not very probing. Well, it doesn't go very far discussing the separation of powers. Then what does he do in Federals 51? He actually goes back to the argument of Federalist 10. Those who, those who know the text and taught it will realize the first half of Federalist 51 and wraps up the discussion of separation of powers. Then he goes back to the big argument of Federalist 10. The big argument of Federalist 10 is about the role of faction in political society. It's not really about the operations. It's not really about the institutional operations of government. It's about Madison's hope that if you have this, you know, the whole theory of factions, but that's going to mitigate the problem because it's going to make it more difficult for factious majorities, the wrong kinds of majorities. Form. So he starts with a constitutional problem, and he winds up giving us a political solution. Or at least that's, that's the, if you read Federal 51 as a kind of quasi crypto proto Strauss. <laughs> I can say this because my dad took Leo Strauss's seminar, so that's, that's, that's about as close as you get to the subject. But if you read Federal 51 with that kind of you know, perspective in mind, you realize this is, this is a trickier text than it might seem at first glance. And I think that carries me back to the one point I would make about if, you know, contemporary issues. It seems to me, and this is you know, commonplace wisdom in our polity. What's the big problem our polity faces? It's the primary system. You know, you can't have smoke-filled rooms anymore because they're illegal. Uh, but the idea that it might be a much better way to, you know, elect officials to allow candidates, to allow parties, you know, the party leadership to appoint candidates rather than primaries, rather than doing by primaries. Excuse me, that's a really promising idea. And that's, you know, that's, I don't know if that's a Madisonian answer because he didn't have a strong concept of primary. Um, but I think it goes back to the issue to what extent are our difficulties institutional, to what extent are they fundamental and political. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Jack, very much. Um, our next speaker is Dennis, Dennis Thompson. Thank you. So we've exhausted the possibility. I thought about actually sitting up <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Your Honor. Um, but I'll, I, I, this will protect me from the audience and <laughs> allow me to see it. You know. uh, I want to begin with a stirring statesman-like uh, quote, see if you recognize it. Uh, it is not the principled partisan, however obnoxious he may seem to his opponents, who degrades the public debate, but the preening, self-styled statesman who elevates compromise to a first principle. For the true statesmen are not defined by what they compromise, but by what they don't. You recognize that? My, I asked my students, and the common guess is Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, JFK, and Profiles of Courage, even Edmund Burke, point to Mickey. <laughs> um, and it, Yes, I bet somebody knows here. Tom Willey. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I was sure somebody should get it here. I was quoting him, not, uh, I thought, as a guest of, of your great state, I should pay tribute to your, <laughs> one of your most distinguished sons. Uh, even more significant, though, for my purposes, his speech expresses quite clearly the attitude toward compromise that uh, has come to dominate part of our current politics. Uh, it's the attitude, we call it a mindset, 
that Amy Gutman and I sort of probe in some detail in our book, which Elizabeth kindly mentioned, The Spirit of Compromise, why campaigning, why governing demands it and campaigning undermines it. Yet yeah, soon to be a major motion picture. <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis playing the spirit. Um, the, but it, this isn't, well, first of all, the uncompromising mindset uh, is not bad in itself. It's, it's perfectly appropriate, we argue. It's perfectly appropriate in campaigns, in protest movements, indeed inaugural addresses last week. Uh, the problem is that it has a tendency to, like some invasive species, to uh, spread out of its natural habitats and take over uh, other parts of politics, specifically the demanding line of, or land of, of governing. So to govern in a democracy, where at least in a democracy where citizens fundamentally disagree, uh, about what government should do, political leaders do have to compromise. And, um, and that's not just in our system. Uh, I think it's also the case, uh, it, it's in our, if you think of compromise as only compromise between the parties or bipartisanship, you're missing a lot of the compromise that has to go on within parties or with, between parties and their supporters. Uh, so it, 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 it's not just our Constitution, although I agree with Sandy that we ought to change it if we could. Uh, in order to compromise, you have to adopt the compromising mindset, which we define as prud prudently adjusting principles and trying to respect, if not like, your opponents. And the, why is compromise so important, actually? Well, it's the necessary means for improving on the status quo, for avoiding disasters like the fiscal cliff and government default. In, in that respect, it's just another name for governing, actually. So it's quite appropriate that um, governability and compromise should be uh, on the agenda, though it's on the agenda thanks to Sandy, I think. So the tension between these two mindsets, this is one of the arguments of the book, is inherent in the democratic process, not just our constitution, although that makes it worse. The uncompromising mindset is actually necessary and desirable to win elections and do a lot of other things uh, that we, we don't want to get rid of. It. And the compromising uh, mindset or attitude is necessary to make and unmake laws. So, we're inclined to agree with Tom and Norm uh, that, and blame the Republicans for the, at least in recent years, for the dysfunction of Congress. But in the book, we try not to do, uh, focus on that so much, to identify a deeper structural problem uh, that we think has become worse in recent years because of the permanent campaign, something, by the way, that Tom and Norm used to worry about. Uh, that problem is likely to persist as long as campaigns and campaign mindsets are part of the democratic process. And, and we don't want to get rid of it. We just want to put it more, discipline it more. So there's a lot more uh, I could say about that. But I, I want to correct a possible um, way of misreading what I'm saying. The book, my view, Amy's view, it, it's not praise for compromise. It's not an idealization or idolization of compromise. It's not an uncompromising defense of compromise. <laughs> We're not against taking uncompromising stance as part of negotiating or bargaining, even while governing. What we want to argue for is something we call the mixing of mindsets. The most successful compromisers in American politics, but elsewhere, have been consummate politicians like Ted Kennedy and Orrin Hatch, who were known and were strong principled partisans. And partly for that reason, 
were able to work together and pass a lot of important health care legislation without being accused by their base of selling out, or at least not by everybody in their base. It was uh, partly something we emphasized in the book and, and uh, Jenny brought out. Relationships develop over time, and you may not like uh, your uh, fellow legislator, but you get to know them, you trust them, you can see into their mind, you know when they're bluffing, you know what their political uh, re constraints really are. And over time, it's not just reputation, but it's the understanding and your opponent involves a certain amount of respect, but also knowledge. And that, that can happen in a legislature if it's properly structured. Or take a more recent example, since Sandy mentioned Mitch McConnell. The behind the scenes we now know, the negotiations that uh, McConnell and Biden did three times, actually, uh, were key, most people in the know say, to the, all three of the compromises that temporarily saved us from fiscal uh, cliff and government default. The, the, uh, summer of two, 2011, December, uh, Obama's only or first bipartisan compromise in December 2012, and then just the last December, uh, now, you know, nobody likes these very much, but they actually saved us from uh, worse situations and probably would not have happened, at least according to my theory here, uh, without the kind of relationship between two very partisan uh, people who didn't particularly like each other uh, but knew enough about each other to actually negotiate. So, uh, a lot of uh, our book is devoted to trying to uh, dispel a lot of the misconceptions about compromise, uh, what really are avoidance strategies, uh, failures to face up to the need to make classic compromises, which are messy, contradictory bargains that nobody likes. Uh, they aren't actually uh, the win-win solutions of negotiation strategists. I, I agree with Jenny that about her dis, um, very interesting contrast between individual negotiations and legislative negotiations. But I also think that the negotiation literature as well as the political rhetoric about common ground and win-win uh, solutions is both unrealistic and has a tendency to actually uh, detract from or make classic compromises which violate principles of both sides and are, require major sacrifices and are not consistent with any theory of justice, make those kinds of compromises both harder and uh, less likely to happen. So stop talking about the common ground is my uh, <laughs> advice to John Boehner. <laughs> and, and to uh, Barack Obama, for that matter. So, um, but I, I'm not going to, I just, I want to highlight, in, uh, just as a concluding point, take a few minutes, just one of the avoidance strategies, because I think it's particularly relevant for a conference like this, which is teeming with proposals for institutional reform. The only thing that there is more of here uh, than institutional reform proposals are prophecies of doom and gloom. <laughs> this, uh, the strategy I want to mention uh, assumes that compromise is not possible or not worth trying until the system is reformed. So nothing can happen until we fix, fill in the blanks, campaign finance, the primary system, the media, the Republican Party, the, uh, the settled constitution. <laughs> so I'm not against in, in institutional reform, and in the book we have a whole chapter, changed primary system, uh, some of the things that Norm and Tom like, we like, some of the things Mickey proposes we like. Even, we even propose lengthening the terms of members of the House, that, by the way, was a, another compromise that 
I learned from Jack, but he didn't mention. Uh, Madison won in three years because he thought it took that long to go, longer to go back and forth. Now we know it takes longer to raise money. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Sherman and uh, others, um, I think Gary, wanted one year to make the representatives closer to the people. Uh, I would like to have four. But in any case, constitutional change uh, or changes of that sort are probably necessary. But um, none of these reforms can happen by themselves. They don't spring full blown from the head of reformers, like, like we are, yes. Institutional change, constitutional change themselves require compromise, which is no easier and maybe harder than legislative compromise because it requires two levels of compromise. Not only agreement on what it, the proposal is, uh, but also an agreement on the process by which that agreement is going to be reached. So there's something like a catch-22 here. You have to be able to compromise in order to bring about the reforms that would promote the comp compromise. That sounds like you can't get started. This quandary could be generalized. I call it the reformer's dilemma. Most institutional reforms can't get off the ground without changing some of the conditions that the reforms themselves are intended to fix. So campaign finance <coughs> reform is hard partly because the corruption it's intended to stop also infects the process by which the reforms could be adopted. Much of what's wrong with Sandy, it's not Sandy's constitution, but <laughs> much of what's wrong, <laughs> it, sort of, uh, much of what's wrong with our constitutions would stand in, in the way of, of Sandy's constitutional convention, that is yours actually, uh, that would try to fix what's wrong. You know, to his credit, uh, Sandy is aware of this. And he, in his book, early on, he asks us what compromises we would be, we would find acceptable in revising the Constitution. Uh, so, I want to suggest in closing that, as scholars and analysts and even pundits, as distinct from activists, which some of you are, and some of us are, some of the time. But as scholars and analysts, we have an obligation to do more than put forward our favorite reform proposals. We should also say what compromises we think may be necessary and acceptable to bring them about, compromises in the process, as well as the proposals themselves. Compromises in attitude, as well as action. And it's, no, it's also an, uh, no escape or no answer to that to say we'll work outside of government, we'll have civil society. That's not obviously going to be any easier either, and you're not going to get your favorite reform in its pure form, or the process of adopting that reform is going itself to be uh, locked in with various forms of compromise. So that's why... Um, we end our chapter on reform, and that's why I'll end these comments, by quoting the eminent philosophical quartet, the Beatles. I, I won't, I'll paraphrase a little bit. You tell me it's the institution. Well, you know, you'd better free your mindset first. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, we have about 15 minutes uh, left where we could, we're gonna, I'm going to welcome some uh, questions from the audience. But first, I'd like to, to pose one, and anyone can answer this on our panel. Uh, Sandy sent around to all of us participants an article from the Washington Post by Chris Saliza, in which he pointed out that we've been in a, a terrible period of depression and then slow growth where there's been a shrinking pie, high unemployment, and low tax revenues going into the government. So what, how to deal with this? The deficit, the debt. 
This has been on the, on the political agenda for quite some time now. So you see this division between the parties over keeping the size of government, keeping government programs, maybe even expanding some, and cutting programs, reducing taxes. Uh, in light of that, he asked, Chris Solicit, is it possible to have a grand bargain anymore? In other words, assuming that there ever were grand bargains, but that in this economic as well as political dilemma that we face, is it possible for the two parties to come together in the Congress, make a grand bargain on these big issues of taxation and spending, or are we just going to be constantly facing three-month debt ceiling crises, sequesters, problems that will be gone, going on and on, and that are appalling to the American people? But without a grand bargain or some compromise, maybe that's our fate. Muddling through and with regular um, crises that tend to make people very nervous and uncomfortable and disgusted sometimes. So that's the question. What is our fate going forward? Does anybody want to address this on the panel? Can we try to say something in about 45 seconds? One way of memorializing grand bargains is to put them in constitutions and to make constitutions <coughs> difficult to change. This is the Senate, this is the three fifths rule, this is a lot of other things. The problem with non-constitutionalized grand bargains, there are some obvious problems with constitutionalized grand bargains, but the problem with unconstitutionalized grand bargains is that there's no reason to think they will stick when the other party gets enough votes to undo them. Why would you? If the grand bargain is only a compromise, that is a bargain. It's not de a deliberative process where I, where we, where there is common ground, but you agree to things that repulse you because better do that than go to the fiscal cliff, then the minute you get the votes to pass your optimal program, you'll do it. And so it does seem to me that the quick answer is we'll lurch through three, six months, whatever it is, but the idea of a grand bargain that will stick indefinitely into the future is basically a non-starter unless it's constitutionalized and you know, I think there are all sorts of reasons not to prefer that route. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with uh, Sandy that grand bargains are very, very unlikely. We're going to get petty bargains, but I a little bit disagree on uh, the reason. I think you can produce a grand bargain and institutionalize it. You set up all sorts of um, things, for example, on immigration, you create a, a hard social security card, you create the um, uh, identity, um, e e identify, I've forgotten the name, but anyway, you, you, you create those systems and then you can dismantle the systems, but it's a lot harder. So, so I think grand bargains could be done. Um, I don't think they're made impossible by the simple fact that majorities change. Um, on the other hand, I think we're not going to get them because of primaries, money. Uh, both of those things are creating extremists by selection and by sanction. You can, it selects extremists, and um, then <coughs> if people who are perfectly moderate don't act in a more extreme way, it sanctions them, it threatens them with non-re-election non, non the next time the primary comes around. They won't get the money from the funders. So I think we are in a in structurally in a situation that, that makes uh, this, uh, Bob Putnam talks in international relations about a two-level game. Negotiators can negotiate, but then they have to go back to their countries and sell it. It's exactly the same way in Congress. You can negotiate an outcome, but you, you have to then sell it to your activists. Not to the public, but to the activists. That's the situation we've got, and the activists aren't uh, buying it. So this is, this is why I think we're not going to get, it's not, the mindset comes from the institutions. I would disagree with the Beatles. Um, it, it's not doesn't come entirely from the institutions because people are selected through who have different mindsets. But you've got to bring in the sanctions there. You've got to bring in the institutions that select them, the institutions that sanction them if they don't do, if they don't carry out their more extreme views.
Okay, so from, from our, unless our panelists, do you want to say something? What I should say. Yes, sorry, uh, Dennis. Just again, of course, institutions, but that's, we've been, everybody emphasizes that, and I think one has to pay attention to the fact you can't change the institutions without also changing your ideas about how they should operate. Uh, on the grand bargain, I too am pessimistic. I don't think it will happen, uh, partly for structural institutional reasons, but two somewhat good news points are that. Grand bargains are, uh, are sometimes easier to achieve than small, petty compromises. The Simpson Bowles, in fact, Alan Simpson said the reason that they pulled uh, that group together and got the agreement that they did, such as it is, was because they put everything on the table. It was, relatively speaking, a grand bargain. Uh, and also, uh, the uh, Boehner and Obama came close, as we know, to reaching it. Of course, they didn't have uh, the, the uh, in both cases, the, the partisan and structural things interfere. One other point uh, that shows that there is some uh, room for maybe not grand bargains, but at least uh, compromises of the sort that we haven't had. It's forgotten sometimes that in the, the height of the debt ceiling crisis, summer. 2011, a majority, strong majority of Tea Party supporters wanted a compromise to happen, even if it would raise taxes. And you saw that a similar thing, although it wasn't broken down with Tea Party, with uh, Republicans in just the last December. Public opinion of the voters who elected these uncompromising right wing House members wanted a compromise, even if it meant. Uh, tax increases. That suggests there is somewhat more room uh, for making compromises and even uh, grand bargains than the, the mantra, you know, we can't do it because the voters don't want us to do it, might suggest. Now, you will immediately say uh, public opinion is fickle, and indeed it is. It probably drops right back down again, and you'll get primary. <coughs> If you take this position, you'll say, where were you when, you know, in this December, you said you wanted to be compromised now. But it, the, the suggestion here is that maybe leader, there's more room for leadership and more room for grand bargains than all this uh, the, the pessimism, which I generally share, uh, might suggest. Real, real quickly, I'm trying to think what are grand bargains in American history. I don't think you can say about the New Deal since the Democrats were predominant politically. Um, but you could say, I think the last grand bargain, just off the top of my head, would be the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in 1964 and 1965. Um, you know, the last great example of bipartisan politics, um, you know, leading to a kind of momentous achievements that we've had. And I suppose there the interesting question, which also relates to the deal, is where does the Supreme Court commit to this as a kind of unraveling checkpoint? And then, you know, until the court does something really decisively on the Voting Rights Act, I'm fairly surprised. Okay, thank you all for that. Um, yes, you, had, you were asking a question. Yeah, this is for Sandy. Uh, so I wondered if you'd comment a little bit about the 1983 Social Security Compromise, which seems wasn't, comp wasn't constitutionalized. Uh, as George Bush discovered in 2005 after the election, it wasn't that easy to move just because you had the votes, or if you had the votes, which you didn't. Uh, so it seemed pretty stable. It seems like a kind of a template that I could imagine you know, uh, it's been discussed many times in other more recent contexts. Um, does that make you a little, I mean, I just want to hear your comments about it. Then I have a story first. <laughs> you, know, you know, the two little boys who are, on the, you know, they're arguing on the street. You know, an adult comes along. He sees what he has to argue about. He says, well, we found this dollar on the floor, and uh, he wants to keep it all, and I think we should split 50-50. And they're almost coming to blows, and the adult says, yeah, you're right. It should be a compromise, 75-25. <laughs> uh, yeah, John is the co-author with Bill Eskridge of a very interesting book uh, on uh, the constitutionalized statutes and makes the argument that uh, many statutes are stickier than certain constitutional provisions. I think that's clearly right. Um, but I mean, Social Security is interesting because 1983 
is almost 50 years since the original case of Social Security. And there's a lot of time for it to develop a kind of general ideological glue. You have the consolidationist presidency in Steve Skoranek's terms of Eisenhower and Nixon, who we should never forget is the last New Deal president. Who knew? Um, where there really was an acceptance of at least the New Deal version of the safety net state so that it's not so surprising. But, but I think your point is absolutely right that we shouldn't have a strict dichotomy between constitutions which can, which can never be changed and statutes can be changed like this because you really do have to explain, well, what statutes really do become so embedded within our conception of what we are as a people, et cetera. And that is an important corrective. Okay, well, okay. this question is, yeah, yes. I have two quick questions, and I think these are uh, probably very Maybe you could stand up. Okay, two quick Here's questions. Here's I think these are very, very important. Oh, okay, two quick questions. I think these are very important. I was driving over here, and I was listening to NPR radio, and they said something real quick, and I didn't uh, understand. I understood what they said, but I don't know what the details are. Specifically, they said that there has been a uh, modification of the con current filibuster rule in the Senate. Uh, uh, it's going to last for two years. The liberals, such as uh, Senator Warren, are not happy with it. Uh, first question is, do you all know what the particulars are, or perhaps someone else, regarding this contemporaneous uh, situation in, in the Senate? Secondly is, uh, what, uh, what are the ramifications uh, in the next two years uh, for the Senate uh, confirmation process, treaty ratification, and legislative, legislative, legislative enactment? Uh, what are the benefits? Okay. Potential? Um, I have just been notified by our illustrious director that um, we're we're coming to the end of our time, and unfortunately, but that is a, a very important question about the filibuster and changes to the filibuster, uh, the pros and cons of the specific changes, and what are the implications, as you pointed out, for legislation treaties approval of, of uh, appointments, et cetera. So um, I think our plan in, um, in light of the time constraint is instead of uh, trying to address that in some really significant way, this, this afternoon we're going to be having at 2.15 a uh, panel on the Congress, and I think that's going to be very, very relevant to that. So if, if you'll attend that, and maybe repose your question, or those of you who are on that panel, uh, if you could take up that question, it's, it seems like a momentous <coughs> step, although it's a small step. It's certainly at, at least um, shown that uh, the Senate is beginning to alter its own internal rules. Okay, so I think we've had an incredible discussion, and I'd like to uh, thank, with you, our illustrious panelists today. For <laughs> treat you to return no later than 11 because it is highly desirable to stay on schedule and the next panel is scheduled to begin at 11.